Welcome to The Arc of Life with Peter Singer. Peter Singer is a world-renowned moral philosopher, founder of the charity The Life You Can Save. Peter is known for his work on applied ethics, especially issues surrounding animal rights and global poverty, where he works from a secular utilitarian perspective. A prolific author, Peter is known in particular for his 1975 book, Animal Liberation, considered the founding philosophical statement of the animal liberation movement. His new book, Why Vegan, is being released later this month. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jenny. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, maybe we can start with most philosophers can expect to wait generations for their ideas to gain traction and, and make a real difference in the real world. What is it about your ideas, do you think, that has meant that you've seen so many changes in connection with them in your lifetime? I suppose uh, it's been timely. I suppose I, I wrote Animal Liberation just at the time when people were ready to start thinking radically about our relationships with animals. Uh, it was, after all, the 70s. People had already started thinking more radically about issues like uh, race and about the position of women, uh, about uh, uh, gay rights, and perhaps it was time for them to think radically about animals. And in terms of global poverty, actually, I, I had to wait a while, I think, for the, my views, which I first wrote in, published in 1972. And although they, they had some impact, but uh, it's really the rise of the effective altruism movement, just you know, barely a decade old now. Um, so I did have to wait. Uh, fortunately, I'm still around and could see it happen. Maybe we should begin by talking about that, the effective altruism movement. Utilitarianism it is having a moment now, really, with the effective altruism movement. Why, what do you think is its appeal today? Uh, first, just let me say that while certainly I think all utilitarians should be effective altruists, you don't have to be a utilitarian to be an effective altruist. Um, you know, you might be a, uh, an effective altruist because you're a Christian and you might think there are some things that you ought never to do, but otherwise you want to help people. Um, and that's certainly, I'm sure we have many such people who are effective altruists. Why is it, why is it having a moment uh, today, though? Uh, it's, it's hard to say, but some of it certainly has to do with the internet. Uh, I think there were always people who thought, gee, shouldn't we really be helping people in great need? Shouldn't we be trying to do the best we can? Uh, why are we tending to think about this narrow, self-interested view, not even really genuinely self-interested, I think, but this material self-interest of, I need to earn more money, I need to have a better car, I need to have a nicer house. Um, and, but I think those people tended to be isolated and they thought, gee, am I the only one thinking like that? Is there something wrong with me? Uh, but because of the internet, people could get together from all over the world and find that there are lots of like-minded people. And the other thing that they could do because of the internet is they can make use of research done by others on which are the most effective charities. And so there's this lively ongoing discussion about how to be an effective altruist. And there are organizations like The Life You Can Save and Give Well, Impact Matters, which are assessing uh, nonprofits to see which are the most effective. And that's been tremendously useful for the movement. Do you think part of the appeal is that we're used to using data to make decisions in this day and age more and more? And this is an approach to doing good um, that ties in with that, that ties into that spirit of the age of, of ranking and measuring effectiveness in terms of, of how much you can make your, your philanthropic buck go. Yes, I think that's a, a good insight. Uh, and in fact, it's interesting that one of the organizations I just mentioned, uh, GiveWell, was started by people who were working for a hedge fund where their job was to analyze the data as to which companies their hedge fund ought to invest in. And then when they started earning more money than they really needed and started talking about, so which charity should we donate it to? And they contacted several charities and found they couldn't get the data. You know, the charities just sent them brochures with smiling pictures of, of pictures of smiling children um and and they said this is not what we want we want hard data to know what you would do with a thousand dollars if i gave you that uh and so they filled that void um so yeah i think that that supports what you're saying that it's data driven uh, you've written about the moral imperative to give this, this famous uh, thought experiment about if you see a, a child drowning, we believe that we, we should jump in to help, even if we're wearing expensive clothes, yet we're presented with an opportunity to save a human life through a small char charitable donation. We turn a blind eye, particularly if it, it's somebody on the other side of the world that we feel that we have no connection to. 
in terms of, of what is moral, is ignoring a flyer from a really effective char charity morally the same as ignoring a drowning child and walking on by? Well, certainly it, it's not emotionally the same um, because seeing the child in front of you uh, does have a strong appeal. Um, and in a sense, you know, so I was playing with the fact that there is that emotional appeal, appeal and that, you know, just about everyone would say, of course, I would jump into the pond. You know, it's a shallow pond. You're not going to drown. So, of course, you know, you can't compare the cost of some clothes with a child's life, they say. But um, uh, when you actually look at the consequences, and as a utilitarian, I do think about the consequences in deciding what's right and wrong, then the consequences of not giving, if you know that this is a really effective organization, if you know that for the cost of your expensive clothes, you could save a child's life or you could uh, prevent somebody becoming blind, uh, then um, I think there is, there is a, more, a sense in which uh, it's just as bad not to help the distant stranger as it is not to save the child. Do you see on a, on a practical level how difficult that would be for, for most people to, to swallow, to, to disentangle the emotional from the moral? Of course. And I have to say that if I, you know, some friend told me, oh, you know, today I just walked past a child who was drowning in a shallow pond because I didn't want to ruin my clothes. I don't think I could, that person could be a, a friend of mine at all. Whereas I'm sure many of my friends, regrettably, but still it's the case, I accept that they don't give significantly to effective charities. So yes, at a personal level, it's really, I, I can understand uh, that it's very difficult to put these things on the same moral level. You do give significantly to, to many charities. Do you think it's possible to be a moral philosopher and not practice what you preach in your private life? Uh, it's obviously possible because there are such people. Um, <laughs> uh, a, a colleague of mine called Eric Schwitzgabel did a survey, if you're really interested, find that not all moral philosophers are certainly not you know, morally superior in general to others. Uh, so it, it is possible, but it's a puzzle to me, um, especially if you're doing uh, applied ethics or practical ethics as I'm doing. You know, maybe if you're just interested in some much more abstract question of theory, are moral judgments objectively true or not? Um, maybe then that doesn't connect with your life. But if you're doing practical ethics and you're coming to conclusions about what's the right thing to do, for that not to have an impact on the way you live would seem to negate the point of what you're doing. You know, why discuss these questions if once you've got to the answer, it doesn't affect your behavior? Would you respect your colleagues less if they didn't practice what they preached? Uh, yes, I think uh, there I could say yes, definitely less. Your ideas are now being put into practice. They're being bankrolled, given the rocket fuel of billions of dollars, where you have big philanthropists uh, deciding where to give uh, according to, to principles that you've helped originate. Does that put an extra pressure on what you do? Well, I'm not the one telling them generally, you know, where to give. There are organisations that, as I said, are researching that and they make their own decisions about that. So, no, I don't feel uh, pressure about that. I, I, obviously, the moral arguments that I've put forward over many years, I'm, I'm glad that they're being acted on by people who have the wealth to make a big difference. And I know some of them have read... Uh, my work, uh, books like The Life You Can Save, for example, and that that's led to them giving substantial amounts. So uh, I think that's great. But um, I, I try to make my writing as accurate and careful as I can. Uh, so, you know, that's always been the case, I think, really. And, and I don't think the fact that it's affecting larger sums of money, I, I don't feel that as pressure. In terms of the, the effective altruist approach, which, which measures in many cases charities in terms of the number of lives that they can save, does it worry you at all that if this would be a, a revolution in our ideas of how to be altruistic, in, a revolution in, in philanthropy, it would mean that there would be no more funding for things like the arts? Because, you know, how can you justify funding an opera when there are people dying? Does that worry you? I... I don't agree that there would be no more funding, full stop, for, for the arts. What I think would happen would be that uh, for a time, uh, more funding would go to the providing the necessities of life to, to people. But it wouldn't really take a huge amount of money compared to you know, what the gross national income of the affluent countries is. 
uh, to meet their basic needs um, so that we didn't have, you know, millions or hundreds of millions of people uh, unable to get enough to eat or living without decent sanitation or not able to get basic health care. We could provide that for maybe 2 or 3% of the gross national product of the affluent world. And having done that, we would still then have funds to fund the arts uh, if, if we wanted to. And I would hope that we would want to uh, once we'd met the more urgent needs. Doesn't this kind of impro- uh, approach imply that we should be focusing our, our, our attention on uh, the consequences of things like global inequality rather than dismantling the things that cause these huge in- inequalities? Doesn't, doesn't capitalism, corrupt go- governments get a free pass with this kind of approach of, of how to do good? Well, if you tell me, you know, your plan for overthrowing capitalism and replacing it with a better and fairer economic system, uh, I'm happy to look at that. And if you convince me that there's a real chance that you're going to succeed in in doing this, then that might become a very effective charity to donate to. But uh, so far... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.